So our next speaker is Professor Jamie Davis. Um, so um, Jamie started as a computer hacker. At the time, Microsoft didn't exist. He actually knew Bill Gates. And then he turned into a physicist, and then um, an MD, and an anatomist, and a physiologist, and a developmental biologist, and now an engineer. And he's going to an engineer of shape and morphogenesis, and is going to tell us about the synthetic biology of uh, morphogenesis. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a great honor to be speaking at this symposium. I, I ought to begin just by correcting one thing. I'm not an MD. I'm a scientist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, in that fabulous talk um, that's just gone by, you heard a lot about the... Um, the model that Alan Turing put forward for morphogenesis, simplified as it is, and the various attempts to, um, to find it in real development. It's actually, um, if I can just be indulgent and take a second to give a, a personal note, this paper is important to me because I studied natural sciences with, with an aim to, towards physics. And I read um, just sort of, you know, holiday reading type thing, Andrew Hodge's uh, biography of Turing and therefore heard about his biological work, so went away to the Scientific Periodicals Library and dug this out, and it sort of switched me to being a biologist, because, because I think what's in this paper that's so critical, it, it isn't just the idea about the morphogenesis. Previously, to study animal development, a lot of it was, was either vitalism, so right the way through the Victorian time it was essentially vitalism, then even with the developmental mechanics of the 1920s, Entwicklungsmechanik, it was called. Maybe it wasn't exactly vitalism, but it was a very long way from mechanism. There were these odd things called inductions and organizers with no, no sense of a real connection to a mechanism. And then the other view was the genetic blueprint view, which is slightly ridiculous. And my blueprint is, is something read as a whole go by some engineer that can then come in from the outside and put parts together. And that's not the way that embryos work. Whereas what Turing's paper did is emphasize that really stupid, dumb things like chemicals acting the right way can create self-organization and create something vastly bigger than themselves and vastly more complex than themselves. And that is very exciting when embryology is just sort of hitting the molecular age and able to open up. So, um, so as I say, I have a great personal liking for this paper, but it's also an amazing paper for the reasons you've already heard. Um, this is a, a view from the paper itself about patches that were, of course, this, was all, this wasn't run on a computer. It was all done painstakingly by hand, or at least with the aid of computers, but those were people, which is what the words computer used to mean. So there are three ways, essentially, of exploring the ideas of these in this paper. And one set, and you've seen some beautiful examples of this already, is mathematical and computer simulation. And it can either be done in something that represents the space of a real embryo, or can be done in some crazy space, like the surface of a sphere, or three-dimensional objects. And there are four- and five-dimensional uh, um, simulations of this, and hypercube fanatics just push the dimensions up and do wilder things. It can be explored by analytical study of real organisms. So this is partly the sort of approach that we've just heard about, where people, um, I, I've chosen this example because Jonathan Bard, who's now retired, was one of the reasons I came to Edinburgh. Um, but he, he was looking at zebra stripe patterns and looking at the embryos and looking at patterns of, of gene activation within the embryo. So connecting what's happening very, very young when the embryo is just forming and everything's simple to what is going to emerge. And some recent work which has, which has been using genetic knockout techniques to be changing, in this case, the space of hair follicles. If you overdo it, you get a bald mouse. But, but if you don't quite overdo it as much, you change the spacing of follicles. And there's a Turing-based model about that. And here's another one which is about teeth and the spacing of teeth. And again, you can play games with genetics and you can change the spacing of teeth. And all of those things are they're compatible with... Um, with the idea that the Turing mechanism is working, but they're not a proof uh, for, for the reasons you've already heard. The last approach, and thank you very much for the trailer, is, is a synthetic one. So this is to say, all right, just for now, never mind what real organisms do. 
In principle, can we take something as simple as the tearing mechanism, build it into some dumb cells that have got nothing whatever to do with patterning, and see if it works? Which isn't going to answer, does it really work in this embryo? But it does answer, can the simple system work in the noisy, chaotic environment of real biology? So, um, sorry, this is just one of the reasons for doing this. Um, so this is an example of, 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 of the alternative. So, this is a signalling pathway, nothing particularly to do with Turing's, just a typical 1990 view of a signalling pathway. Now that we've learned a bit more about it, and it's a typical one, this is what it looks like. And this, this is wholly typical of when you start exploring biology, and I don't know about your reaction, this is mine. <laughs> and it's, I think, very probable that these patterning things, even if based on the tearing mechanism, will end up looking a lot like this. And that's another reason for just wanting to strip it down and ask, will the simple system work at all? So the whole the thrust of this is, is actually captured in a, in a Richard Feynman quotation, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And it's, it's something, this has become a bit of a mantra of the synthetic biology community, at least those who want to use it not so much as a tool for making new biofuels or new drugs, but who want to use it as a research tool, that what we're doing is thinking, you know, as if, for example, as if we wanted to understand how things flew, and the only thing that we could look at was a 747, and nothing simpler. So we analyse our 747, and we look at all of its systems, and we think we understand flight. To test that we understand, let's see if we can build a paper aeroplane and just flick it across the room, and that will tell us have we got the basics or not. So that, that's the point about creating simple things from, from the abstract ideas and seeing if they work, even if real life, real four and a half billion years evolved life, has added a few complications. Synthetic biology is a fairly new field, so I just want to introduce it very briefly, although it does get a lot of coverage. It was defined um, by the Royal Academy of Engineering in this way, as something that aims to design and engineer biologically based parts, novel devices and systems, as well as redesigning existing natural biological systems. And except for one thing, it's an excellent definition. Um, the re in redesigning tends to give biologists the heebie-jeebies, because most of us are not creationists at heart, but... Not quite sure how that one wasn't spotted. It's a very rapidly growing field. Um, this is just a, a graph of PubMed citations, and you can see it taking off very quickly. And it has four main branches, I suppose. One of them is the construction of synthetic life, the trying to, trying to do a non-living to living transition. And there are various approaches to that. Um, one of my favourites is by an Italian group um, headed by a Professor Luisi who works on micelles of membranes and has systems where they, they can grow and reach particular sizes and reproduce and go off and seed new ones. And I think it's one of the most impressive um, approaches towards synthetic life. He doesn't claim it is life. I don't think anybody would, but it's an interesting approach. Another reason that people do synthetic biology is, is novel biochemistry. For example, there is a drug which is useful against malaria called artemisinin, which is very difficult to get because its natural source is a rare plant. And Jay Kiesling and colleagues engineered a yeast cell so that it used bits of plant metabolism to make a very near precursor of artemisinin and make the actual production of the drug very easy. Something more relevant to this audience and perhaps to, to the whole theme of Turing is computation. So people have built inside cells, including um, a computer scientist who ran away and joined my biology group to do his PhD, having already got lots of computer science stuff done. Um, he built a little memory circuit inside bacteria. These are, these are conventional... OK, these are straightforward truth tables. These are conventional electronic engineering pictures of things like an inverter, a gate, a set-reset latch, uh, and, and so forth. Um, this is the geneticist's way of drawing things. So these, a long line like this will be a bit of, bit of chromosome. An arrow coming off is a gene that can be on or off. These boxes are called promoters, and they act essentially as conditional switches to set whether a gene is switched on or off. And promoters will be themselves switched on or off according to whether they bind to something. In this particular case, this thing called ET will sit on this promoter and stop the gene being switched on unless this thing called erythromycin is in the cell. So essentially, giving this signal gives an inverted output, like an inverter. You can join these things together to create logic gates. 
You can join them together to create set, reset latches and so forth. You can do things in the analog domain. This is a Schmidt trigger, um, so something which exhibits hysteresis to turn an analog input into a digital output. Um, you can make pulse generators, and you can make oscillators. This is a, a, a free-running oscillator. This would be a mad way of making an oscillator in electronics. It would sort of work at very uncontrollable frequencies. This is the biological version. And all of these have really been built, and all of them really work. And there's, there's a big sort of industry, in inverted commas, of, of grad students churning out this kind of stuff all the time. Um, and people have, have clagged them together with things like enzymes, for example, to make an output so that they can take a photograph of, of a word and print it on a bacterial plate, and a very wise choice of word for what those people managed to publish. <laughs> then the last part, which is where, where the thought that we're connected to, is the use of synthetic biology to make novel structures. <laughs> Now, the, the core of my laboratory is straight embryology and developmental biology. We're interested in how organs form, and in recent years, we've become interested in applying our knowledge of how organs form to tissue engineering and potentially to building new organs for people who need them. Um, so we, that's straightforward tissue engineering, but we're, we're also linking um, synthetic biology towards this so that we can have programmable tissue formation. And Elise Kasha, who's just had to jash out of the room to go home, alas, is, is leading that at the moment. But this is the area um, where, where we're also interested, of course, in building patterns um, for tissue engineering. And that's where we think that trying to build, that's where we think there's a use as well as just the research interest in building a Turing type system in culture. This is a work in progress. So, what I'm going to do now is to tell you about our design and to give you a flavor of biological engineering for those who don't have to suffer it and give you our preliminary results. But, but I can tell you now, we haven't yet put all the components together to build the pattern generator. So, what we're trying to do, we decided just for, for the sake of compatibility with our technology, we weren't going to be able to do this just with diffusing chemicals. We needed to build genetics into it because really most biotechnology is geared to doing genetic manipulation. So this, again, same convention, bit of chromosome. Here is a slightly compound gene that encodes two molecules, the activator and the inhibitor, with exactly the same meanings that were in Philip's talk. The activator um, diffuses, it, it, it's produced by the cell, turned into a protein, leaves the cell, can bind to a receptor on the cell surface, which fires off cell signals inside the cell that activate the production of more activator. At the same time, from the same kind of promoter, either literally the same promoter or the, or the same one in the cell, um, there's an inhibitor being produced that also is turned into a protein, leaves the cell, but it blocks the ability of the activator to do its job up here. So that's the simple design. It's not quite as simple as Turing's, but it's close. These are the design requirements that we have. So the first one is that the activator, I've sort of mentioned this already, the activator is extracellular and it controls gene expression. The extracellular part is important because the thing needs to diffuse. We also need the inhibitor to be an extracellular protein, partly because if it works outside the cell, that helps us test the components. We can add inhibitor deliberately to check that we shut activator down and so forth. We need this relationship between diffusion constants. We need to have chosen molecules such that the activator diffuses far less well than the inhibitor, and, and that we know that. We're not just guessing. Ideally, we'd like an activator that clings to cell surfaces, because that makes everything much more controllable and avoids problems with convection currents and all sorts of odd things that can happen in a tissue culture dish. We'd like a way to modify the diffusion constant experimentally, because that would allow us to change that parameter in real life and to change it in a computer model and to see if we get the same things. We'd also like to be able to image the amount of activator and the amount of inhibitor at any particular moment, which means that it would be nice to make those fluorescent proteins, which usually means putting a fluorescent tag on the end of a perfectly respectable ordinary protein, so we'd like to choose proteins that we actually know can have those tags put on them and they still work. The tags don't break them. And we need well-characterized promoters, and we need an epithelial cell line that will behave itself. An epithelial cell line, those are the types of cells that form sheets of interconnected cells, so they'll all be neighbors, and there won't be peculiar gaps and islands. 
So the first thing we did in, in designing this is look through all of the signaling molecules we could find for possible pairings of activators and inhibitors. And there are quite a lot, um, because biology normally has off switches as well as on switches. So, for example, bone morphogenetic proteins, which, as the name suggested, to do with skeleton development, um, can be inhibited by proteins of the gremlin family. Um, Wnt can be inhibited either by frisbee or crescent. I'm sorry about the silly names, but there we are. FGF by... This is actually a drug-type antibody developed to fight certain kinds of tumours. Um, but it is a protein, so it could work the same way. There are lots of those. So there are lots of candidates for, for these molecules. Fortunately, for different reasons, one pair of them had been um, studied in, in early embryos of Senapus, which is an African clawed... Well, it's called the African clawed toad, but it's actually a frog. The toad bit was a mistake. And, and the diffusion... The, these were made to be expressed in just one cell or just one or two cells in the early embryo for a different reason that was nothing much to do with patterning. But it meant that we've got these pictures available from the group who did this, and you can look at how well the, the, um, the wnt, which is the activator, spreads and how well the inhibitor, which in this case is frisbee, spreads. And here, the activator is following the purple line and the frisbee is following the green line and the cell is here. So the, the activator is diffusing away very weakly. It is, but it's weak, and the inhibitor is diffusing away much more easily. That's what we want. That's exactly what we want. So that's, that's encouraging, because we have our pair of molecules and we have a pair that's got the right... Um, at the right diffusion relationship. Also, it is thought with pretty good evidence, although not completely nailed down, that the molecule Wnt, which here is called WG, just because this is a fruit fly paper and people never agree on names of things, um, it, 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 it spreads mostly by sticking to the cell surface. And there is, there's a lot of data to, 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 to back this up, and it's difficult to explain a lot of effects of mutations in fruit flies unless you assume this signal spreads along cell surfaces. So that's also useful. It wasn't essential to our model, but it's really nice. Um, also, we'd like a way to modify the diffusion constant experimentally. That's not essential, but it, uh, again, it would be nice because it would be nice to be able to change parameters of our constructed thing and then to see how that corresponds to mathematical modelling. And again, very helpfully, um, probably the reason that this thing sits on the surface, surface at all is that like sticking to a complex carbohydrate which we bear on our cell surfaces called heparin sulfate and a few other complex carbohydrates. And the the point about this table, I won't attempt to go through it in detail, but what's happened here is that people have altered the, the carbohydrate structure of heparin sulfate, and that's something we can do very easily with drugs, and, and it so happens my lab has a lot of experience in that from the 1990s. And these are various um, signaling molecules. This is our, is our Wnt, our activator, and it turns out that there are big effects on its diffusion if the carbohydrate structure of heparin sulfate is altered. And so that gives us a way in to do this with a simple drug addition. So, again, this is looking quite optimistic. Uh, we'd like these molecules to still work, even if we make them glow. That way we can know where they are and how much of them are there. Um, and this is a paper that was... Um, that was actually about signalling range, again, in frogs, uh, in patterning the early embryo. Not patterning in the sense of stripes and things, but patterning about this is the head, this is the tail end. Um, and these authors used a fluorescent protein called Venus, tagged it on to the, um, to, to the Wnt and separately to the inhibitor, and the, pro and the Wnt and the inhibitor still worked in the way they're supposed to as a Wnt and an inhibitor, which is nice. I mean, it's not a surprise because Venus was deliberately engineered to be very small and harmless, but it's nice. So that means so far we've, at least, we've got a pair of activated inhibitors that, that satisfy all of these conditions, well-characterized promoter systems that can be switched on by the activator. Well, we're wint... I mean, to be honest, this is one of the first things we looked at. Um, there's, this is one of these horrible slides that biologists love of signaling pathways in the cell. 
um, and I'm going to blank out everything we don't need to look at. Um, this is our wind signal. There are some proteins with wonderful names like frizzled and disheveled, which relay the signal. The fruit fly mutants, uh, where those proteins don't work, have their hairs in all sorts of mad directions. Another one's called Bad Hair Day. Um, I love fruit fly mutant names. For example, we were t talking um, at lunchtime about, um, uh, about alcohol sensitivity, and fruit flies have a mutation in alcohol dehydrogenase that means that they're very susceptible to ethanol. The mutation's called cheap date. Um, so, we have, we have our wind going through a fairly simple pathway in the cell. All of these things are around in most cells and ending up going into the nucleus. And there is a, a commercially available um, promoter which was engineered by looking at all of the things that are switched on by WINTS and finding a consensus sequence. So all of the, you know, e each individual promoter has got its own sequence of DNA base pairs. And people who studied this years ago found a consensus sequence, synthesized it, and found it was a brilliant promoter for responding to WINT. Um, so this is it, and this is it in its plasmid called Top Flash. And, and although, actually, uh, it's got a long, complicated name. I'm going to keep calling the whole promoter top flash. It's quicker. And it can be switched on by, by giving wind and switched off again um, by taking wind away quite neatly. So the last requirement is to have a cell line in which we can try all of this, which is epithelial, so it'll form a nice single-layered sheet. And it can respond to wind signals naturally, so it has all of that stuff inside itself needed to relay all of the signals. But it doesn't make wind of its own, because if it does, that would be bad. That would muck up the whole experiment. Um, so these are a particular favorite um, cells with, within the lab. They come from um, the kidneys of a spaniel that, that I was going to say donated to these cells in about 1956. I'm not sure donated is the right word, but anyway. That's what they come from, and they've been used in labs the world over. And we were very lucky that somebody has actually used these cells a few years ago to study the action of WINT and some of that pathway I was talking about. Um, but the point, the point in this paper is that if they gave WINT to the cells, they would respond, but they weren't showing any response unless you gave them WINT from the outside, which is exactly what we want. So all of this is quite hopeful. We think we have a candidate design now for all of this. So the basic design is that we have our top flash promoter, that's the WINT responsive promoter, the one that's switched on by this arrow. We have a gene encoding WINT8 attached to Venus, which is the thing that'll make it glow. Uh, a little device here to allow it also to encode, to, 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 to allow two proteins to be made from the same gene. This is just something stolen from yeast. It, it's, it works generically. And Frisbee, which is our inhibitor. And we, this is our positive loop that WINT8 activates its own production. And our negative part that Frisbee blocks this, and as I mentioned before, Frisbee diffuses much, much better than Wint8. So for actually constructing this, um, there are several stages. So the problem with biological construction, it's not quite like electronic construction where you can go to radio spares and get your 2% tolerance resistors and your tested transistors and things. In biology, because we're stealing bits from life, we're generally still making assumptions about what works. So Bitter experience tells us we have to take quite slow steps and test everything. Because if you just try to cobble everything together at the scale of you know, building a television out of electronic components, it just won't work. Um, so our steps. First of all, we just want to, first, we want to check one assumption, which wasn't clear from the original papers, in, in that we can get a graded response, not a digital one, from that promoter to WIMP signaling. Because it's not supposed to be digital. It's supposed to be analog, all of this. And then we want to make sure that in our system, which is a simple cell monolayer in culture, we get some kind of spatial gradient of response to a source of WINT with no inhibitor present. So this is only the response with, without any inhibitor there. Because if the gradient is so shallow that it's bigger than any culture dish we have, we're doomed. If it's so steep that it won't go even to a neighboring cell, we're doomed. We'd like something which goes a few cell diameters away, and a few is something between 5 and 30, I don't know. Um, 
And then the next day, just to build a system which has got the wind, but it doesn't have the inhibitor, just to check that as soon as we give a little pulse of wind, the whole system drives us onto positive feedback and locks up forever. That's just a sanity check that that's working the way it should. And then if we pour on a bucket load of the inhibitor, which we can just do just by literally pouring it on, then we shut it all off again. Again, sanity check, it's working as it should. And then build the complete system. So... This is, um, these are preliminary results that have come from some project students. Although we've applied for, to the Levy Hume Trust for funding for this project, please wish us luck, um, I'm, I've been lucky enough to have some project students interested, so we've been using bits and bobs of cash to, to start it off anyway, because I'm quite excited by it. This is a dose response. So this is um, Matt and Charlotte built the top flash promoter driving um, a fluorescent reporter and have tested it against different concentrations um, of an agonist of the wind pathway. That is something which, which, which switches it on. And there is, although this is non-zero, which is slightly concerning, we'll have to live with that, I suppose, there is a reasonably good analogue type dose response there. It's not a step function. It's a nice line, which is what we want. Then a rough measure of the spatial gradient. Um, th we've done this so far only crudely, which is to grow a dish of these cells that are, that are reporting wind activity, and to put in part of the dish an embryonic tissue, because in, when I'm wearing my other hat and doing kind of the day job part of my lab, we're dissecting mouse embryos a lot, um, which is a rich source of wind. And if we do that, so this is a, this is a, a fluorescence plot, sort of this is, this is a square of the, of the culture dish, height up here is fluorescence intensity. This is just showing where directly on top of the cells the wind source was. And you can see there's quite a nice sloping away. And this is about 20 cell diameters across here, which is very nice. That's kind of what we want. Unfortunately, um, that's the last slide that I can show you because that's as far. I'm sorry, I did warn you. Um, Charlotte, who is on, on this slide, has come back to, do, um, to, to, to work in the lab all summer. Um, so we stand a sporting chance of getting to the end by the end of the summer, I hope so, um, at least for our first pass. What we have done is put the diffusion constant in a few... A, a few uh, the, the, sorry, we, we don't have a mathematical diffusion constant. I misspoke. We've put the... We have tweaked the diffusion constant in the model so that it generates the right spatial curve that we just measured with no inhibitor there, and have then gone back to the full model with that in. And this is the size of, of our little sort of... Um, of our smallest culture... Um, of our smallest culture vessels. And the prediction from this, which has still got an awful lot of guessed parameters, is that we will get patterning of the right sort of scale. And there are still guesses here, but, you know, that, that's what we're about. Um, if it does work, we can have fun doing a rather literal version of these animal pelt things. We, can, we work with a colleague for other reasons in Glasgow who can treat tissue culture surfaces so that we can make cells... She can treat them so that any arbitrary shape that we can specify with high resolution is completely repellent to cells, so it just leaves islands that cells like. And we've been doing this for a different project to test how the curvature that cells are under alters their activity. And that's been a very interesting other project, but it would take another talk to, to cover. But we could, of course, make little pelt shapes and actually run this at different scales, literally different scales, because um, we can print these at any size, um, and see if we can, can get the sort of patterns that we'd expect. The other thing I really love about MDCK cells, which is this type of cell I was telling you about, this is how they grow in flat culture. You're just looking at a culture dish, and each of these spotty things is a cell. If instead of growing them in a culture dish, you grow them in a gel of collagen which is very roughly that greasy stuff you get around the inside of a pork pie, um, <laughs> then we don't actually get it from pork pies. We get it from rat's tails. Actually, I probably prefer getting it from pork pies. But um, If you put them in collagen, then they form cysts. So this is a hollow cyst um, of about, I don't know, somewhere between a 50 and 100 microns across. So that means if, if the scale of this is appropriate, then we could look for patterning on the surface of a sphere. And also, most interestingly, these cells, if you then treat them with something called hepatocyte growth factor, it's just something which was named that because it, it causes liver growth, but it also makes 
epithelial cells make branch systems. These cysts, and this is a much lower magnification now, so this would fit in there. These cysts shove out long branches and make, make long branches rather like the branches of a lung or the branches in the kidney or the branches in the mammary gland. And that means that we can have a, a, a three-dimensional tube. In terms of the, of the distances across the tube, um, it may well be rather like that leopard's tail. It may well feel like being one-dimensional to a patterning system. But it means we can run the same patterning system in the same cells in radically different geometries. And, and these remarkable cells give us that for free. So, for example, we could... I mean, there are some obvious top-of-the-head predictions that given the way that it works, you'd expect the ends always to show activator highs because there's no inhibitor feeding into them from a neighbour. You know, there are, there are some easy predictions and then there are some predictions that will require proper modelling. So that is as far as we've got. Um, I hope you're enthusiastic about the idea. We certainly are. Uh, occasionally we find other biologists who are. Most of them think we're mad. Um, but I found talking to non-biologists, <laughs> they tend to be much more enthusiastic about the idea. I'm just showing this last picture partly as a thank you to the people in the synthetic biology part of my lab who have all been contributing a lot to this. Uh, and then just to give you a, a little bit more of a context that we, as I said, we do ordinary organ development, uh, tissue engineering. Uh, we, we're the centre of a big USA NIH-funded database programme that's been running. It's in about its seventh year now. And we have lots of collaborators from other parts of Edinburgh. And right at the top, this is the relatively new logo of Synthesis, which is a centre in, in Edinburgh now for systems and synthetic biology, which has been very recently launched in that form. And it's, um, although we're not physically in the building, we're members of that. And it's been very exciting to be part of that community. And I'm looking forward to lots of interactions. Thank you very much indeed. I'm Gerald Lincoln, and I'd like to ask you, um, you spoke, most of the discussion really is about morphogenesis, the sort of patterns we see in colour, um, tissue patterning. Um, I'm interested in temporal patterning as well, where you get uh, rhythms generated in a tissue, um, and some of the rhythms can cover the life history of the organism. In other words, the animal goes through a developmental biology, and then it goes through a rhythmic biology as the seasons pass by. So that's a type of patterning. I wonder if you um, considered modeling this type of thing where feedback has to create the cyclicity in the morphogenic state. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not my direct interest, but there are many modelers of this, and particularly in Edinburgh, Andrew Miller's group has been, um, has been instrumental in modeling a lot of these slow, the sort of diurnal type rhythms. So, I mean, rhythms extend from, you know, heartbeat to menstrual cycle to, to flowering cycles or something beyond. And yes, most of them do indeed use activators and inhibitors, and some of them use very slow connections between them. So, for example, the somite clock that was alluded to in the earlier experiment uses molecules like HERI and so forth that they have a... Um, it has a clock... It, it, it's, a, it's an activator and inhibitor loop with delays, and those delays set the pace of the clock and therefore set the number of vertebrae that we form. That's what somites make. Snakes, with a huge number of vertebrae, have... I was going to say mutation. That's not fair to snakes. They have a different amino acid sequence in that gene and it makes the clock run very, very quickly indeed. So they bud off lots and lots and lots of vertebrae. And there are lots of models for that kind of thing. It's not our expertise, but it's, it's very definitely done. And that's an area where I think modelling has been tremendous for informing experimental biology. I get the impression that it's not just a chemical diffusion uh, phenomena, but it's also a cell migration phenomena. So you have stem cell... Um, uh, niches which generate cells that then move out into the tissues and that process which has long time constraints in some cases weeks and months generates a renewal cyclic renewal from the stem cell niche yes that must and be a different principle yes and there are also inhibitors that operate that way so that for example the stem cell sitting in the bottom of the niche is inhibited from dividing and making new tissue by the presence of healthy tissue already there. 
as the signals from the healthy tissue diminish, as it becomes less healthy, so the stem cells will multiply to replace it until they've done so. And a great deal of our, not just our development, but of our maintenance as, as fully grown animals is run by stage N plus one signaling back to stage N saying, don't do it, stay where you are, don't make more of me. And that way, if anything, it's a kind of fail-safe system, because if anything disappears, more of it will be made. Thank you. Um, you showed an example of a simulation of what one thing you, you hope might happen in the, the cell line when you have developed it and, and grown it in the dish. Um, and indeed, you, we see patterns appearing. But that's kind of informal presentation to us. Are there more precise criteria for success in this or for recognising when you do have patterns that look like uh, the patterns that you anticipate from Turing mechanisms? There, no, to be honest, we don't have formal criteria. We have the reproducible the reproducible production of patterns, which is not the same as the production of reproducible patterns, um, the reproducible production of patterns, given that, that our ordinary cells are pattern-free, and we know that, just, just the presence of pattern right now we'd regard as success, to be honest. And, and, and in the way that scientific authors always do, whatever pattern we come up with will be the hypothesis that we set out to test when we write the paper. You've been hijacking the wind pathway. Did you think about, about uh, maybe doing this uh, in a different way, like creating your own signaling orthogonal I, system? So I think if this works, I think intellectually a much better thing to do would be to generate a completely engineered protein that, that cannot talk, you know, to, to, to engineer the system or to steal from plants or fungi or something ridiculous to which animal cells can't respond. Um, that, would be, that would take a long time and would be difficult. So we chose to do the compromise of reusing animal things in cells that don't normally do patterning to see if we can make patterning. If we ever use this kind of thing for tissue engineering, actually for clinical use, I'm talking way, way down the line here, then they would have to be molecules that can't interact with the body so that we don't get unwanted crosstalk. So one day it will all have to be completely synthetic. But just now, this is a first step. So to follow on that, I thought you were going to say you also had a, an evolutionary interest into this thing, and maybe this rewiring is actually something that... It's a, a metaphor of things that have happened. Well, there is... I mean, I, I'm not sure the synthetic approach is the best way to understand how real evolution happened. Um, you know, some, some of it's justified not just to understand development, but in the same sense that trees don't make these things, but we have a reason for wanting to know how to make them and learning how to manipulate wood. Um, we want to manipulate life to make useful things. To understand, we can model evolution this way, as you can on a computer, but we're still then back to the situation that here's our model, but we don't know if that's how it really happened. Uh, and... I think the best use for it in understanding evolution will be if we think, you know, if there's a bunch of six mutations in a zebrafish that's changed its stripe pattern, and we want to know which one's the critical one, then I suppose this approach could be used to answer that question, yes. So I'm curious, right now you're looking at uh, engineering uh, modifying the natural system to produce this patterning. And I'm wondering if you see far if in the future, you see some computational simulation of cells progressing to a point where you could really investigate this type of research computationally instead. Yes. I think the interplay between wet lab biology and simulation is it's very important. And one of the outputs will be models that we can use instead of wet lab biology. And it's particularly important in development of new drugs, for example. For a lot of pharmacology, you know, drugs are tested on rats, and the predictive value is only just better than 50%. In other words, you more or less may as well flip a coin about whether the drug's safe or not, or useful or not. And testing in a lot of the animal models is just not working anymore. The easy drugs have been done. And the not, not just animal rights groups, but but huge, you know, big pharma are desperate for 
in, for wet lab models and for computational models that will represent human physiology better than anything we can do. And there's a really strong drive, and there's an awful lot of money being, you know, if somebody has a good way of getting a better human model, the likes of Glaxo are throwing money at them. So, I, before we thank you again, I want to apologize for saying you're an MD. That's all right. No, I wasn't offended. I just didn't want anyone to keel over and call for me. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so it falls to me to, to close today's proceedings. We heard last night that Turing had an interest from a very early age in nature and life and mechanisms and mechanical tools for understanding those mechanisms. And I think we've heard today a variety of tools of talks showing many different facets of that interest and how it has developed over the intervening years and how people are still carrying that forward. And I think if he'd been here, I hope he would have been really quite excited, as a lot of us have been, by the talks that we've heard. So in a moment, I'd like us to thank our speakers again. Before we do that, there's a few other people I'd like to thank, um, the RSC and particularly their event organization staff who've been outside helping us all the time, the AV and uh, video people who are here today to record the event, the PhD students who've done great jobs helping with microphones, and the particular, I'd like to thank John Oberlander, who didn't get credit this morning, but was very much um, my partner in collaborating on this and choosing the program. And uh, I hope you've all enjoyed it, and let's thank all our speakers once again. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.